This Heavenly Father, I thank you for a wonderful day that you've given us as it's another Sabbath day. Thank you for bringing us through this week safely and that we've been able to get through it with all the trials that we're here at your Sabbath day again so that we can rest. I ask that today as we're at church that what we're about to hear will bless our hearts. In your name we do pray, amen. Does that sound familiar? Well, it should because you're doing it right now, unless you are dead. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about the breathing process. The breathing process begins by us taking air into our body, which then circulates through our respiratory system, removing carbon dioxide and bringing life-giving oxygen to us, therefore purifying our bodies. Now, what do you think I am trying to spiritually tie this to? Prayer. What do you think about when prayer comes to mind? Usually, to most modern Christians, it is something you do only before you eat, when you are taking a trip, when you go to church, or when you need something. But there is so much more to prayer than that. Prayer is much like breathing in the sense that we constantly need it to spiritually cleanse us and remove sin from our lives. Stop for a moment and see how long you can hold your breath. Why can't you continue holding your breath forever? Yes, we need to breathe to live. That's just how our bodies work, and that is how the spiritual part of our body functions. Without the constant renewing of God's Holy Spirit in our lives, we spiritually die, much like when we physically die, if we do not breathe. That is exactly why Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 states, Pray without ceasing. This verse is so short, but so powerful. It really brings to life the idea that we should be in constant communication with our Heavenly Father. Does this mean we are constantly walking around with our heads bowed and eyes closed? No, absolutely not. Can you imagine what would happen? That could be dangerous. Most of the time, we are not even aware of our breathing. We don't even have to think about it. It just happens naturally. God wants us to be so aware of his presence with us that it becomes natural to communicate with him throughout our day, just like walking through the day talking with a friend. Here are some following examples of how we communi can communicate with God as a friend. We can wake up thanking God for another day to be alive, thanking, thanking him for the bed we slept in, the clothes we put on, etc. We can pray for our neighbors as we leave the house to go to school or go to the store. We can praise God for the beautiful sky or flowers we see as we're out and about. We can pray for the many, many people we pass that they may come to know Jesus or for the missionaries on the other side of the world. We can talk to God about our fear, our worries, about our disappointments, our excitement, about the future or the past. We can talk to God from our first waking moments to the time we lay our heads on the pillow, asking him to protect us and help us sleep. Prayer is not limited to certain times, situations, or even people. Christ is always ready to hear us and is more than willing to answer our prayers. Next time you breathe, why don't you lift a silent prayer to God and thank him for all he has done for you. Delightful, splendid Sabbath, everyone. <laughs> What are some adjectives that you all can use to describe this Sabbath? Just throw some out. All right. Definitely. The Sabbath is all of these things. It's more than just happy. So, you know, we got to increase our vocabulary. Um, before I share with you guys this story, I want to read a quote from Education, page 95. And it says, Through the cooperation of the Divine Spirit, the labors of the humble men whom Christ had chosen stirred the world. To every nation under heaven was the gospel carried in a single generation. Isn't that crazy? One generation carried the gospel to the entire world. And God has given us that same mission. And I'm going to share with you guys a story when I was canvassing. Um, so I got dropped off at a hospital, and I was just in the parking lot. It was actually pretty busy, so I was talking to the people there. And this lady came out, and as I was talking to her, I noticed that she had a name tag on, and it said chaplain. So I realized that she was the chaplain there at the hospital, and I ended up showing her the DVD Daniel Chronicles, um, which is about Bible prophecy, and she was really interested in that one. And she was like, yeah, I love prophecy, and she really wanted it. And so she asked how much, and I told her the prices, and she's like, you know, I really don't have the money, but I really want this. And it was like, like the first five minutes of the day, so it's not like I had over donations or anything to give it to her. I was like, oh, man. So I wrote her a receipt so that she could, you know, call the school and get it that way. And then I went on my way. And right after her, I talked to another person 
who gave me money but wouldn't take anything. And I was like, oh yeah, I can go back and give her the DVD. And so I ran back to the other side of the parking lot, but she had already left. And I was so sad because I said, man, I know she really wanted it. She was so interested in prophecy. And so I prayed. I was like, Lord, please help this lady to meet another canvasser so that she can still get that DVD. And I prayed that prayer and I went on my way. Then later in the um, evening when we were doing homes, um, I met this gentleman who came out and I was sharing with him several of the books. And he was really nice and very interested. And he ended up getting... um, like the health book and the great controversy. And he was very nice, and I said, is there anything I can pray for? And he said, you know, actually, um, my wife is a chaplain at the hospital here in town. And I was like, what? I was like, was she there this morning by any chance? And he was like, yeah, that's where she works. I was like, I met your wife at the parking lot this morning. And I was like, she really wanted this DVD, and I showed it to him. I was like, please tell her I wanted to come back and give it to her, and please give her this DVD. And so because of my prayer, I was actually able to meet her husband later that very same day and able to leave them not just with the Daniel Chronicles, but also a health book and the great controversy. So God answered my prayer in a bigger way than I could have expected. And God wants to do that for each of us too. And he wants us to be able to reach those people that are searching for truth. And we have a responsibility to be able to reach everyone in a single generation if we are putting forth our faithful efforts. So So the song I'm going to be sharing with you guys is one that's very special to me um, just because of um, the times of saying it before. But the lesson today is talking about Nehemiah and it also talks about the law and and reading like the word of God. And I know growing up, and maybe some of you can relate, I thought of the law as very, like, constraining, and it was not something I enjoyed. But when I accepted Jesus into my life, that mindset started to change. And when I heard this song called Write Them on My Heart, I realized that Jesus had changed my mindset from hating the law to loving the law and loving Jesus who gave me this law. And so this is what this song is about, is the true perspective of how the law fits into our lives and what it means to our hearts. The 
Special happy seven. <laughs> uh, Jenny, thank you for thank you for your song, and uh, I think we heard what she said. Uh, this week we're going to study about the word of God, and before we do that, I just want to have a short word of prayer. Let's let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much, Lord, for blessing us throughout this week already, and now we have beautiful opportunity to come and study your word. And Father, I just want to pray that you guide us as we read this word and as we study into it. And may it stood out to us and may it be something that we can apply into our life, Father. Please let your spirit to dwell among us right now. And Father, I just want to pray that you help me not to do everything on my own, Lord, but to do with your strength. And Father, I invite for your spirit right now. And please speak to us according to your will. And in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Let's turn to our Sabbath school lesson. It's on page 46. Um, so we, today, this week we are going to talk about the word, right? And um, the memory key text, I'm just going to let you guys read it by yourself. And we're not going to read it. It's in there. The memory key tells us uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8. So in this Sabbath school afternoon lesson, or morning lesson, we learned that the, the Jerusalem wall was finished. The wall was built. And, but we know that the story be, before the wall was finished, and there are a lot of enemies and, uh, you know, they, they came to God's people and distract, distracted them so that they would not finish the job or the work that God is commanding his people to do. And I learned that, you know, in our spiritual walk with God, when we want to grow in God and when we want to walk according to God's will, I learned that Cynthia will bring trials and discouragement and he will use man, many different types of people, you know, just to discourage us so that we will give up on the work that, you know, like on the, you know, the, 
the expectation that God has for us. And sin has come just to distract us from that. But in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 16, can somebody read it for us? We'll hear what he said. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 16. Michelle. And it reads, And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of God. But there we see that when, um, you know, because the, the, the people here at first, they are, the God's people almost gave up on building, but because of the leaders, you know, he, he encouraged them and because they endured the trials and, and, you know, willing to face the things that they have to go through. And God was able to finish the job for them. And God, I, I can see that God is helping them to, to finish the wall, you know. And in chapter, uh, Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 16 shows that, you know, Whatever enemies will, will come to us, whatever they will do to us, you know, if we are stay faithful to God and endure the trial, God will take care of the enemy for us. And here in uh, verse 16, we see that, you know, God let the enemy down. After, after you know, um, they build the wall, you know, the enemy cast it down and they, they are no longer, they're no longer happy, you know. And um, after that, after they finish the wall, we know that the... The Jews are, you know, come up with the leaders or a governor. They choose the leaders based on and uh, based on their spiritual leaders, you know, and, and that is that's the good choice that they make. And so now we are wondering what is, what is going to happen in the other few days study lesson that we we are about to go study. So let's move to um, Sunday's lessons, and the title is called "The Gathering uh, the People Gathering Together." And let us read. Let us read. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. Who, who would like to read that? Nehemiah, uh, yes, Sharon. Nehemiah 8, verses 1 and 2. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation both of men and women, and all could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. So here we, we see that the people are, after, after they build the wall, you know, after they, they finish their job, and now they are, they're asking the leader, they're asking uh, Ezra, Ezra to, to, you know, bring God's word to them, and then so that God so that he will remind them all the words that you know God gave it to Moses, and and the question is why is these people asking for the question from you guys? Why are these people asking for God's word? Why did they want to hear God's word? Um, was it true that Nehemiah had been reading it some to them? Yeah. And then so they were getting to where they loved it, just like um, <coughs> Jennifer was singing in the song. They were starting to love God's word the more they heard it. So they wanted to hear it more and more. Yeah, and be, because, you know, when if, I, I think when Nehemiah read it to them, they pro, when, as they listen, they probably meditate on it too. And, you know, the thing about God's word is righteous. And so when they hear it, they're like, wow, God's, God's word just, you know, it's a benefit for me. It's not, it's not going to hurt me, you know. It's, it's not keeping me away from my freedom, but it's actually giving me a, a guidance for my life, you know. And if you read in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 9 and 13, would anybody like to read that? And this one may ask our question also. Deuteronomy chapter 13, uh, I mean chapter 31, verse 9 to 13. Deuteronomy 31, 9 to 13. And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and unto all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, at the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year release, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men, women, and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear, and that they may learn, and fear the Lord your God. 
and observe to do all the words of this law, and that their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, as long as ye live in the land whither ye go over Jordan to possess it. So right there we, we see that um, Moses also commanding the children of Israel to always remind themselves with the law of God and to, to, to keep it with them, you know, where they, wherever they are at. And so this is one of the reasons why they also ask Ezra and, or Nehemiah, you know, to come and read the book for them and the laws. And we, we, when we leave, read in the lesson, it's just, it's just not about the laws, the laws but the, the, uh, the lesson to us that uh, it's actually all the books of Moses, five books of Moses called Torah. And uh, so, what, what is special about this word that they're reading? What is special about them? Yes, it is from the Lord, yes. If you look in Psalm 119, 105, um, it tells us that the word is a lamp unto my, what? My fear, right? right? A lamp unto my, uh, my path, right? A light unto my path, right? So God, God's word, it's, you, if you remember a lot of your promises, there are, there are a lot about God's word. God's word it's, it guides our life. Uh, we know that God's word is, uh, is our counsel. God's word is our teacher. God's word can be benefit for us in many ways into our life. And above all, if we truly, re, truly realize it, you know, God's word, it's actually something that we should depend on because, yeah, um, yeah Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Rodriguez. I think they were, um, it was a perfect timing to get to the point of reading the law. They were working on their physical protection. Yeah. And now it was about time to also focus on what will be, you know, what is, what, what is in the book for their spiritual protection, for their growth and their relationship with God. Yes, that, that's true. That's true. And the, and, and the thing about God's word, it's actually um, helping us with our eternal destiny. So if you don't know where, where you're going, God's word is the one that will guide your life. And that's the reason why it's very important to remind yourself in life and to, to walk according to God's will because these, these words will leave you, leave you to eternal life. And yeah, brother, go ahead. Um, in the verse, it says that, they, that the children were to read the word and they were to learn and that they may fear the Lord. Mm -hmm. And we know fearing God is the first part of the everlasting gospel. And to fear God really is to love him. I think it's Psalms 95 or 97 verse 10. It says, ye that love the Lord, um, ye, that, um, ye that love the Lord hate evil. And we know the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. So learning, reading the word of God is so that we may learn how to love him, so that we may get to know him better. And the more we get to know him, the easier it is for us to love him because you can't love somebody who you don't really know until you really you can't really grow into a deeper relationship with them until you get to know them, which causes you to love them more. I think when, when they came back from Babylon, you know, seeing their own city broken down was a great reminder to them of the results of their disobedience to God. And I think they were constantly reminded that unless they reminded themselves of the law of God, unless they were obedient to it, they were going to go back into the very same things that had caused them to be taken captive to Babylon. So they realized the need to learn more of God's word and to be more obedient. That's true, and, and that's, that's the reason why when we think about this stuff, and it's very, it, it leads us to think that God's word is very important. And the thing about God is, you know, whenever we go astray, he always, he always finds a way for us to, to make us realize our need. And that's the beautiful thing. And so, um, as the people are gathering together, we want to also look at what, what they are doing in a, in a mundane license and lesson. And um, there's a lot of Bible verses that give it to us here, but we're only going to read uh, Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 3. Let's read from there, please, from mundane lesson. I'm just moving quick, just so that I can go through all the <laughs> lessons. Would anybody like to read it? Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 3. Nehemiah 8, verse 3. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday, before the men and the women, and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. So here, the people, 
we, we learn here in, in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 3, people gathering themselves together, and Nehemiah or Ezra read the books to them until, until when? Midday. And that's a very long time, you know, from morning to midday. And I'll be honest with you, I never read the Bible that's that long. Usually when I read the Bible, I probably read it about 30 minutes and get tired of it and go to sleep or something. But that's, that shows that people, they're really longing and they, they really want to seek for God. And, and so that, that's very amazing. I, I, and I wish, you know, that each of us, we, we have that kind of desire, desire for ourselves also. So the question I, was, I want to ask you guys, what, what is Ezra read to them? So if, if you think about it, um, let me just ask you, um, it's basically God's word because, you know, um, he's reading to them God's word and also the history just to show them, you know, um, back in the past and how God has been leading each one of them through, the, through their lives. And uh, now the, the question is what makes these people long for the word of God so badly, you know? And why did they pay so close attention to, to God's word? It's neat to see how they came to him asking. They gathered and said, hey, can you, can you in verse uh, 1, they spake unto Ezra, and, uh, and they, wanted, they wanted to have it shared with them. They knew, you know, when we, when we chose to go away from following your word and understanding and doing what it says, that's what took us into captivity. We were disconnected from you, and so we know this, these are the words of life. This is what connects us with you, the source of life, or God, the source of life. And so they just wanted the real thing. They wanted to understand him and his principles so they could really connect well with him. And that's where their, their, their protection was. That's where they would have longevity here on this earth, and, and whether they understood all of the new earth kind of thing then or not, they understood that it was connection to God that made a difference, and it was his word that was going to help them understand him and connect well with him. And I can imagine, I, I would assume they would, you know, five books of Moses, that takes a while to read through. For well, sure. And, uh, <laughs> but they were sitting and listening, and I'm imagining they, they were hearing the story of creation and remembering, yes, we, we worship the creator God, not, not some of these other gods that are around that we've heard of and live near, or, you know, live pe near people who believed in those. Mm -hmm. we, we serve the living God. And all of that was just helping them reinforce to them, these are, this is life. We're, we're back here and we're serving God and that's what life's about. And so, so spending time in the Word just helped them reorient of who we are and, and who's our God and what life's about. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was words of life to them. Yeah, it's kind of show us like uh, the meaning and the, the purpose to our life also, yeah. Yeah, Michelle? Yeah. Um, along with what Pastor Kevin was mentioning, I think it also comes with knowing the power that there is in the word. Because if you don't think that there's anything important in it, if you don't think that it has any power in your life, why spend your time on it? Mm -hmm. But if you know that there's power in it, that it can change and it can do things for you, you will have that more of a desire to, you know, what can I learn of the Lord? What, what will he teach me now? And so that's something that will make it possible for someone to have that, to spend that amount of time in the word because the understanding of what it can do for their life. Amen. So now we, we kind of get the point, you know, uh, that as we read it here, we see that God's word is very important for us. And... Uh, it's the one that guided our life and lead us in the right path. So I pray that we take this one into our life, you know, take, and, and we'll start reading our Bible also. Because I know that I'm guilty of myself sometimes. I don't, I don't read my Bible, but I, instead I read other books. So yeah, um, so how can, how can you have the desire, this, uh, you know, the same desire as these people have here to, uh, to, uh, in, the, in the lesson that we study? Yeah, um, I think, honestly, I, I believe prayers will start. I know for myself, when I started reading the Bible, it was coming from a background of hating to read. Mm. And I had to say, Lord, give me a hungering and thirsting for your word. And sometimes we don't think of asking God for simple things like that. Like, Lord, give me a desire to read your word. 
And sometimes what he may do is he'll bring a trial in your life to cause you to read the word. So it's like when we ask God to give us a hungering for the word of God, he'll place within us a hunger and a desire. And if anyone wants us to read his word, it's just the Lord. So simply just asking God and saying, Lord, help me to read your word more. Give me a desire to. Uh, Mrs. Rodriguez. I like what it says in the lesson. There is a comment here that says, saturating ourselves in the work creates a deeper yearning for God in our lives. And I believe that <clears throat> another way is um, making a decision to read it and sitting and reading. And I have heard so many testimonies of people that that's how they got deep into the study of the Bible. It's just by sitting and reading, even though they did not feel like it, they yeah. did not have the desire, but God creates in you. The more you read, the more you just are at peace and understanding better. So we kind of like have to have a choice to be open. You know, we have the choice, you know, so we can be open and then allow God to, to work through us, and, and he will do it. And I remember one of the verse that Jordi shared with me a long time ago. Um, it's funny. Jeremiah chapter um, 24-7. Does anybody want to read it? Jeremiah 24, 7. This yeah, Jeremiah 24, 7. And I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. For they shall return unto me with their whole heart. And, this, and if you think about the, uh, the, uh, the chapter and the verse to 24, 7, it's kind of like God will change your heart 20, 24, 7, you know, and, and if you are open to him, and if you are really longing, you know, even though you may not have the heart to want to read the, uh, the Bible if you open up yourself to him, you know, choose to open the Bible. I think God will leave you to, to have that interest. Do you have a thought? Yeah. Um, you know, after we prayed and we say, Lord, like, I'm going to take your word, um, and you, you see, you claim a promise, and then you see it being fulfilled, because you have, not only have you, not only do you have the knowledge now, but now you have the experimental experience that is like, look, the word of God is true. Then that's when you're like, Lord, let's go. Give yeah. me more. Give me more Bible promises. Show me as well. And when you read those stories, they're applicable to you in a way that it, you know it's applicable to you. So I think one of the other ways is as well is claiming those Bible promises and making it personal to you as well. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Janita. For me personally, one thing that has really motivated me to study more were times when I have put myself in positions where I need to share with others. For example, canvassing or when I was doing Bible work, where you start to realize, you know, Lord, if I don't study, I'm going to run out of things to share pretty fast. So when we have to share, we start yeah, to feel, feel that or feel that need to be constantly filled. Like the disciples, you know, they couldn't, they knew that they couldn't feed the multitudes unless they themselves had something to give. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what I would usually do too. Sometimes when people do ask him to share anything, I would put myself into a position where I had to force myself to read the words, you know, and... And God's, God's blessed with that. God blessed with it. Um, does anybody have more thoughts? If not, we're going to... Oh, yeah. Yeah, Sister I was going to say, um, I've met many atheists while canvassing that have read the Bible all the way through, probably even more than maybe some of us have read it, because to them it's a history book. And um, so I think Ellen White gives an awesome remedy for really like wanting to read the book, but for more than just reading it as a book. And she says to spend a thoughtful hour each day contemplating the life of Christ, especially yeah. the closing scenes. And that has been revolutionary in my life because when my devotions went from just reading and reading, because, you know, you got to get fill in that daily quota, to everything I read, I have to find Jesus in it. Since that, it has changed, like, and it just makes the whole Bible come alive. Yeah. Like, when you're in the Old Testament and you can see Jesus in some story, you're just like, whoa, whoa, let me read more till I find my, whoa, whoa you see that? Yeah. You know, it just makes it exciting. So when, like, I think looking for Jesus in every single thing you read will not only make it, like, come alive to you, but it'll make you excited to want to read more. Like, yeah. wait, wait, my time's up? No, 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 you know? So I think that's a really amazing remedy for one yeah. desiring to read it more. And it's more meaningful to you, too, right? Um, so uh, now it came into my mind. Um, 
we, when we read the verse, it says the people pay so close attention, right? Intent, attentively, like, um, so that's, the question is, you know, why is it so important for, for us to have a, like a, a good uh, attitude when we're reading the, the, the word of God? That, you know, it's, it's have a, the right attitude. Because people here, when, when they listen to the word of God, they have, you know, very respectful attitude. You know, they, they listen carefully. And why is it so important for us to have the right attitude? Brother um, Joshua. You know, it's be believing, that you're, believing that you're reading the word of God will help you have the right attitude. Like, I was thinking, like what Jennifer said, and what Ms. Rodriguez said, like, if you just open the Bible up just to, just to read it, you know, it might not, might not do you any good. But if you open the Bible up with a definite aim to know who you're reading about, mm. like, even if you don't know God or know anything, if you, just, if, you, if you go to the Word of God believing that it's the Word of God and you want to learn about it and you just start reading, it'll change your life. But you have to have, you have, to have that definite aim. And, and, and to have the right attitude, you have to believe that it's the Word of God. Like it's not just a book. And you have to b believe that. When you believe that, it changes the way you open and turn the pages of the Bible. As I was thinking, and, and they mentioned on Monday's lesson that part of the reason that the people were so open to hearing the Word was probably because of Ezra's reading and teaching the Word for the 13 years before then. And also probably because of his example. Yeah. But I was just reminded of the verse 7, Ezra 7.10. And the purpose, what is the purpose for opening the word in the first place? Is it just to have something interesting to listen to mm. or to be inspired? I think Ezra had it right. He prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. Why? Not just to learn something new or to be inspired, but to actually do it. He, was, he set his heart before he even opened the word that he was going to do what it said. And I think that's what, it, that's what caused the people to want to listen because they hadn't heard. They were like, okay, what can we do? How can we implement this? How can we make it practical in our lives? That, that could be true. And also, uh, I, I think uh, maybe right during that time, the Holy Spirit probably working also. To, to reach out to their heart, to long for the word of God. And now uh, let's move to uh, the Tuesday lesson and talk about the reading and interpreting in the word. And um, we, we're going to read the verse given to us here in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 4 and 8. Would anybody like to read that? Nehemiah 8, verse 4 and 8, verse 4. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Matatahiah, and Shema, and Aniah, and Uriha, and Hilkiah, and Maaseah, on his right hand. And on his left hand, Padiah, and Mishael, and Malchiah, and Hashem, and Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Mushalam. And verse eight, so they read in the book of the law of God distinctly, and gave them the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And so right here we have a two group of people and the reader, you know, I mean one group is reading and then the other group is like translating. And we, if you read in the, in the lesson, you know, you, you understand how people, because the Israelites, they, they marry with other Gentiles and then those Gentiles speak Aramaic instead of Hebrew. And so that's why they need a translator. And, and so when we read the word of God, why is it so important for us to you know, translate it in the, the right way or whenever we share with other people. Why is it important for us to share with people in the right way? For, I, for our psychology class, um, we were, we're reading about, um, you know, how they say that truth is, like, if it's useful for me, it's good. But yeah. if it doesn't work for you, then it's not truth for you. So it makes truth very, um, is the word subjective or relative? Yeah, yes. So it, rule, it, it destroys what God says, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, sorry, I, read that. I said that wrong. But, you know, the point is that God is the truth. 
And so when we present to someone something that is in the incorrect context, we're, repre- we're misrepresenting God. Mm-hmm. And so that's why when we read all of our, it's important to come in the attitude that, look, this is the word of God. This is God who created the heavens and the earth. When you come with that attitude, your own desires, inclinations, opinions disappear because you know this is the word of God. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's important that we do that because you know, it represents how God is portrayed as well. Yeah, and I like that idea too, how and if, if it works for you, then it's good for, it work for others. Yes, Pastor Powell. Last Saturday night, Jennifer Landis had a very nice uh, musical concert, giving her testimony between songs. It was really nice. And one of the illustrations she gave really stuck with me. In fact, I used it in worship the other day with the guys in the dorm. And that was having a sponge inside of a plastic bag Mm -hmm. and dipping the bag down in water, in a pitcher of water, and wondering, why is it staying dry? I'm going under the water. And it's kind of like with us, when we come to a worship service or or even a Sabbath school time, if if we have some kind of a barrier in our own mind uh, with the Lord or with others or, you know, an attitude or even an attitude of, you know what, I'm not going to get anything out of this anyway, you know, if we don't share the sense of it, if we don't help it to, to, to be practical to the lives of people who are there right now, we're just letting them window shop. Mm-hmm. You know, just looking, but not buying anything, not receiving something good. And if we don't understand, we're not going to receive it. So what a good expression in here. You know, they gave the sense so there was understanding. And so we have to break it down for each of us to understand. And that's when we can, we can really let the water go into the sponge of our lives and not just have that outward thing of, I know for young people, and I say it to my son often, son, let's not window shop. You can get something out of this. If you believe you can, open your heart to the Lord, and he'll give you something that will be meaningful to you. Mm-hmm. And so to have it in our own language, to have it, explained in practical terms is so necessary. So what a good example of this here, that they were explaining it, not just reading it, Mm -hmm. and so that all could be able to understand and see, oh, that makes sense. I understand it now. And also the the reason why it's so important for us to translate in the right way is because, you know, God's word is just not just information and just a word that totally changed your life to a new person. And, you know, you may live in a, a place, you know, if you live without a God's word, you probably may end up in a place that where you're very miserable. You're, you're not having like a meaningful life, but when you have a God's word in, in you, you, you see there's a purpose and there's more meaning to it. Um, does, anybody, does anybody have more thought or we can move on to, oh, Brother Moshe, go ahead. Yeah, I just thought with canvassing, we meet all types of wonderful people who have read the Word of God and they've studied the Word of God and they come to very strange conclusions. And I think that's important for us as well, for those who are speaking, for those who like to share verses when we're talking with our friends. We never know how that person is going to interpret it. And they could say, wow, that wonderful girl just shared something with me today. And let's say the girl shared it in a way that was like wrong and they go off and they share it. They're like, yeah, hey, mom, dad, did you know that the Word of God means this? And that goes so far. And how we share the word of God is going to affect more than just us. And like what Judith was saying with personal opinions, if we go to the word of God thinking, having a presupposition in our minds based on our own background, based on something that we don't like, then our interpretation is now going to affect the next person, which is why it's so important to say, Lord, my understanding of this word isn't just for me. It's for the next person that you asked me to share it with. So it is important to come to the word of God with no bias with saying, Lord, wipe away all of my presuppositions, take away my own opinions, and show me what it is that you want me to understand. So we also, kind of like, we also have to be careful about what we're sharing, you know. And I mean, if you know it, it is, it is good, then go ahead and share it, you know. So, um, and now uh, let's move to our Wednesday lesson. Um, I just want to go through all the lesson as much as I can. Um, so here is the people respond after after you know um, the the reading and the translation of the 
on the word of God at the, at the gate or where the, the place where they are gathering. And uh, they give us a verse here in uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 9 to 12. Um, would anybody like to read that again? Maybe I should just pick a people. Huh? <laughs> okay, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Nehemiah 8 and verse 9. And Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Hold your peace, for this day is holy, neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to sin portions and to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. So here, that when I read this, when I read this passage, I just remember the Bible verse says, uh, the law of the Lord is perfect and it converted the soul. And here it is, all the, all the you know, people that listen to the word of God, they got converted because uh, of their sins and they realized how evil they are, and you know they they were more and said about it, and they cried about it, and and the the question that I want to ask you for for you guys is that I mean here we also see you know the revival is beginning, everything people realize their sins. So, uh, why why is it that we are not very you know like sorry about the sin that we committed sometime in our life? I think the reason that a lot of times we don't see the significance of the cross and of the fact that Jesus saved our lives, it's really interesting that Mr. Myers here is because with all the movies that we watch, we're used to people saving the world. Yeah. It's become normal with, because that's what every superhero movie is about. We are used to the cross because now it's not an instrument of torture. It's a pretty little sign that's above your door. It's a pretty little thing on the side of your wall. It's not doesn't have the weight of the significance of what it used to. And so I think that that's the reason that we don't see it, our sinfulness as it really is, and it's a lot like harder to actually see the cross and see the weight of our sin and be sorry for it, because to us, it's become normal. It's become something that's really not that big of a deal, because we've made it a pretty thing. That's a good point. Yeah, um, sister. And we have only two minutes left, so we're going to try this. Um, I think sometimes that's why uh, God uh, makes us go into a lot of trials because the only way to recognize the value of the cross is when you get there, when you bow at the cross. Um, so I don't know if you have uh, read the book or seen the peregrines, the, yeah, per pil pil Pilgrim's Progress. So he was carrying his bag of sin all around until he got to the cross. The more you are forgiven, the more you love God. Mm. Exactly. Sorry, my English is... No problem. My English is not good either. Um, <laughs> and I read, I read a... One day I was reading, I was reading one of the, the books from uh, Jer Jeremiah. And... Maybe I'll read it to you guys very short. It says like this. Perhaps I can still illustrate this. Suppose I were to visit a friend's house and I didn't notice the beautiful, is it vase? Um, is that how you pronounce it? Vase? V-A-S-E? And, it, and um, holding the uh, beautiful colors of flowers behind the door and before the evening is over, I accidentally knocked it over and the vase and, and it breaks. There it lies in a thousand pieces on the floor, and I think, well, that's too bad. I wish I hadn't done that, but I'll pay for it. And so I got, I got to my friend, the owner of, of the house, and said, Brother, I'm sorry I wasn't paying attention as I was passing your, 
your vase and I accidentally broke it. I want to get you another one to replace it. How much did it cost? And I think in my mind, it's that $20 ought to do it. But I noticed that he looks quite solemn, and I said, what's the matter, friend? You look so sad. He, he replies, Pastor, I have to tell you uh, that this is very rare antiquity. It has been handed down in the family for a number of generations. There's only one vest like, like it in all the world. It is, it's in a safe in New York antiquity shop. It can be bought for $20,000. And tell me, friends, and don't take it lightly. Am I sorry then I was uh, two minutes ago? Why? What happened? When I found out the cost. My dear friends, the reason we are not very sorry about sin is that we don't sense its cost. And then also, he also talked about how like, uh, there is one uh, church, and they, they call it uh, the universal church, which is the Catholic church, how they make sin cheaper. You know, when we commit a sin, we can just go pay it. You know, and that, that's kind of like what Satan is trying to do for us, to, to make us things that we can pay for the sin. We can make up for it. But in reality, we can't pay it because Jesus Christ uh, is more val valuable than anything else. You know, God, it's God's only son. He, he gave it all for us. And um, so I want us to get to, to get the point that, you know, we, we can't pay for our sin, but, but God got us. And the last lesson they talk about is the, the, the joy of the Lord. And, and we should be rejoicing in the Lord because, you know, he, even though we commit a lot of sin, he doesn't hate us, but he hates the sin that we committed. So um, I guess that's what we learned throughout the, this week's lesson is basically, you know, how the, the word of God can change our lives and uh, how important is our sin also, how we should realize it, and we should come back to the word of God and, and study it more so that uh, the word of God can lead us to where our destination is supposed to be. Yeah. And let's pray as we close it up. Um, Father in heaven, Lord, I just want to thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. And I thank you so much that we are able to come and talk about your words. And Lord, may we continue to think about and meditate more about it, Lord, as we go through our days and continue to bless our Sabbath, Lord. And we invite you to your spirit to continue working with us, Lord, in our lives. And please continue to guide our life, Lord. And give us the desire to work, uh, to have the heart to read your word also, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.